Hi, welcome back to After Your Service. I am Jet Bautista, I'm a nurse and respiratory therapist, and I'm here to teach you basic tips, tutorials, or advanced topics in critical and respiratory care. So if you're an RT student, an intern, a practitioner, or anyone who is interested in critical and respiratory care, hit the subscribe button and click the notification bell below, so you'll be updated once I post a video regarding these topics. So last time, we talked about metabolic acid-base disorders, particularly normal gap acidosis, elevated gap acidosis, and metabolic alkalosis. We have also presented some ways to manage these disorders even beyond the scope of respiratory therapy. But this lesson is completely different because this time, we are talking about respiratory acid-base disorders. And as you will soon find out, the management for these disorders are primarily for respiratory therapists. So before we proceed to the discussion of the specific acid-base disorders, I think it is important for anyone who is studying ABGs to understand the alveolar ventilation equation, which illustrates or which describes that the PaCO2 is equal to the volume of carbon dioxide produced in every minute as represented by your VCO2 multiplied by the partial pressure of inspired air all over your alveolar ventilation whereby the alveolar ventilation is simply the product of your respiratory rate and the difference between the tidal volume and the anatomic dead space as represented by your V sub DS the anatomic dead space volume is equal to 1 ml for every 1 pound of body weight. <clears throat> for example, if we have a 150 pound male patient, then the anatomic dead space volume for this patient is equal to 150 ml. So if we're going to rewrite the formula, we could say that PaCO2 is equal to the volume of carbon dioxide multiplied with partial pressure of inspired gas divided by the product of the respiratory rate and the difference of the tidal volume and your dead space volume. This equation also tells us that the PaCO2 is directly proportional to the volume of carbon dioxide produced and also directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gas that enters the lungs and inversely proportional to the patient's RR. So out of this equation, we can draw the following conclusions. High PaCO2 would result from having a low alveolar ventilation or low alveolar volume. Conversely, high PCO2 would result from a high dead space volume. However, clinically speaking, it's only low alveolar ventilation that affects the PCO2 remarkably. High dead space volume actually only causes minor changes in a patient's PCO2. So let's start the lesson with respiratory acidosis. In our previous videos, we've defined respiratory acidosis as a pH less than 7.35 and a PCO2 higher than 45. Respiratory acidosis could either be chronic or acute depending on the compensation. Respiratory acidosis could be fully compensated, partially compensated, or no compensation at all depending on the level of the bicarbonate. And in our previous discussion, we also mentioned that the response of the metabolic component is much much slower compared to respiratory compensation. Now, what causes or what are the etiologies of respiratory acidosis? So we can summarize them into the following. First, obstructive lung disease. Any obstructive lung disease, but particularly our COPD and asthma, which are the two most common obstructive diseases that you will encounter in respiratory, well, in your respiratory subjects. Second, another etiology is when the patient have, when the patient has rather central hypoventilation. 
or anything that lowers the patients alveolar ventilation. And among the different causes of central hypoventilation, the most common clinically are drugs such as your alcohol, narcotics, or your midazolam, diazepam, these are your benzodiazepine. So these drugs or chemicals decrease the respiratory drive, leading to acidosis. Another cause of central hypoventilation is when there are brainstem lesions. So brainstem lesions could make the blood pH acidotic or alkalotic depending on its location. When the patient has a condition which we call an obesity hypoventilation syndrome or a central hypoventilation syndrome. So a third group of etiology for respiratory acidosis is when the patient has a neuromuscular disease such as if the patient suffered from spinal cord trauma due to a vehicular accident for example or a high fall other other etiologies under neuromuscular diseases would also include myasthenia gravis and Guillain-Barre syndrome which are technically muscular weakness causing the patient to well breathe at a slower rate a fourth group of etiologies would also include a poor or low compliance or the movement of the lungs are restricted. For example, if the patient has ARDS, an interstitial lung disease, or restricted disorders such as kyphoscoliosis, but clinically among these causes only ARDS probably has the highest well the highest rate of cause significant respiratory acidosis another group of etiology is again if the patient has hyperproduction of carbon dioxide, which is a result of hypermetabolism. And this usually happens when the patient has an increased body temperature as seen in fever. Another is when the patient is, again, overfed, especially with much carbohydrates. When carbohydrates are, bro are broken down, they produce large amounts of carbon dioxide. And also if the patient has prolonged seizure, And for our last etiology, I'd like to stress that other videos or other tutorials that I've seen discussing respiratory acidosis, they generalize that the management for respiratory acidosis is mechanical ventilation. But they fail to mention that respiratory acidosis could actually exist even if the patient is mechanically ventilated. So when, the question is when, when does respiratory acidosis happen, occur, or exist? In a mechanically ventilated patient so this is true or this happens when the mechanical ventilator settings make the minute ventilation low so let's just write here low minute ventilation so anything so any setting that gives the patient a low minute volume would cause respiratory acidosis so basing from this you can say that there are a lot of things that could cause respiratory acidosis actually the list gets even longer but let us identify what are the most common that you will encounter in your internship or in your clinical practice so the most common etiologies that you will encounter clinically or in your internship are number one COPD only severe bronchial asthma produces respiratory acidosis. During the early or mild stages of bronchial asthma, usually a patient would hyperventilate or will be tachypneic, so, so you don't really expect respiratory acidosis to occur. Under central hypoventilation, the most common is drug overdose. 
So we'll include that. So we have COPD, drug overdose. And third, when the patient has obesity, hyperventilation syndrome or central hypoventilation syndrome which is a combination of which is a combination of poor lung compliance and the presence of obstructive sleep apnea since um, obesity is one of the major risk factors for developing sleep apnea and for today's lesson we'll also include mechanical ventilation a low mid volume settings in mechanical ventilation as a common cause. So for today's lesson, we will focus on the four causes, COPD, drug overdose, obesity, hypoventilation syndrome, and central hyperventilation syndrome, and inappropriate ventilator settings. So we'll start with COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So the primary problem in COPD so a lot of times I've experienced this, when you ask a student or an intern to define COPD, he would say, he would definitely mention blue bloaters and pink puffers. To be honest, I don't really like this kind of description or classification of COPD. You don't, it's, it's like presuming that COPD is easily assessed in the bedside, while in fact, based on my experience, it's not easily recognizable. and and sometimes the symptoms of emphysema and chronic bronchitis overlap. Anyway, let's try to find out how COPD causes respiratory acidosis. So there are two primary problems in COPD. The first one is there is airway inflammation. So if there is inflammation, you would expect that there is an increased production of airway mucus, which is in itself a form of airway obstruction. Now, especially in the emphysema type of COPD, the other problem is we have a destruction of destruction of the lung parenchyma or the basic or fundamental unit of our respiratory system. And this destruction would result to, and this destruction would result to a decrease in airway traction. Or in other words, decrease in lung elasticity or the ability of the lungs to return to its original shape or size once it is fully inflated. And this is again another form of obstruction since the lungs can get fully emptied with the air. Now if there's obstruction, the body's response to this obstruction is to hyperinflate. Or in other words, the lungs get bigger in size. Now the problem with hyperinflation is that it doesn't actually increase the amount of gases available for respiration, but the end effect of hyperinflation are number one, the development of auto peep or intrinsic peep. So COPD patients develop what we call an auto peep. This is the opposite of lung collapse. Normally, once a person exhales, the alveoli must empty out the CO2 or the air that's inside, so the alveoli gets deflated. But what happens in COPD, because of hyperinflation, the lungs stay inflated even after exhalation. Now, because the lungs are hyperexpanded or hyperinflation, the other organs, particularly the diaphragm, must adjust. So what happens or what results from this is the flattening of the diaphragm. So this further both auto peep and the flattening of the diaphragm leads to a decrease in the tidal volume and as we said a while ago anything that decreases the minute volume 
which is the product of the tidal volume and the RR, would lead to an increased PCO2. So if there's a decreased tidal volume, this would decrease the alveolar volume. <coughs> Meanwhile, the decrease in elasticity or decrease in airway traction causes a decrease in the surface area exchange for the exchange of gases for the exchange of gases particularly across the alveolar capillary membrane i'll just write it as sam so there's a decreased surface area in the alveolar capillary membrane so since there is a fewer surface area for gas exchange then these alveolar units become dead space or these are units or the presence of many dead space units, then alveolar ventilation also decreases. <laughs> now, as we've said in the introduction of this video, a decrease in alveolar ventilation will lead to an increase in PCO2. Now, here's where things get worse. When, when the PCO2 increases, the chemoreceptors becomes less sensitive, oh, less sensitive to changes in PaCO2. So the chemoreceptors located in our carotid and aortic bodies becomes less sensitive to PCO2 or carbon dioxide. And the end effect of this is it would further increase the PCO2. So, it, so what happens is it practically worsens the problem. To be honest, this is only a summarized version of the process or mechanism by which respiratory acidosis develops in COPD patients. Actually, the pathophysiology of COPD is by itself very much complex. Suffice to say, for our understanding, this is how we can illustrate <clears throat> how COPD increases the carbon dioxide. <clears throat> so the respiratory acidosis that is caused by COPD is usually chronic in nature and it doesn't need to be managed as long as the patient is stable. A COPD patient will live the rest of his life with an elevated CO2. Most of you must have heard of the term um, hypoxic drive. And what they usually teach about the hypoxic drive is this is what causes a COPD patient to breathe. Well, this is not completely true. It's actually not the hypoxemia that stimulates the COPD patient to breathe, but rather the high carbon dioxide. For the control of ventilation, we have what we call chemoreceptors. So we have central chemoreceptors. I write like a chicken and peripheral chemoreceptors so the central chemoreceptors are located in our medulla and our peripheral chemoreceptors are located in our carotid and aortic bodies now these chemoreceptors are sensitive to the changes in blood pH and PCO2 and well a certain degree oxygen, changes in oxygen. Contrary to popular belief, it's actually the high PCO2 or high amount of carbon dioxide that makes a COPD patient breathe and not necessarily the low oxygen. The hypoxemia that is present in a COPD patient is actually only secondary to the hypercarbia or the elevated PCO2. So what is my point here exactly? I just want to stress that when managing a COPD patient in acute exacerbation, we're not actually treating the oxygenation, but rather we're trying to restore the balance of the pH. It's not by correcting the oxygenation problem, it's a separate concern, but rather it is actually trying to restore the PCO2 to the pre-exacerbation levels. For example, before the patient was rushed to the hospital, the PCO2 was about 65 millimeters of mercury, now let's say this patient has um, contracted pneumonia and hence he was admitted to the hospital. The PCO2 has further increased to about 80 millimeters of mercury. Now your goal is not to normalize the PCO2 but rather to return the PCO2 to a level before the exacerbation occurred. In this case, 
you bring back the PCO2 to nearly to around 60 millimeters of mercury and not within the normal range. So how do we manage respiratory acidosis that is secondary to COPD? Now for most respiratory therapists, the first thing that comes to mind is mechanical ventilation. And mechanical ventilation can be done either invasively or non-invasively. So let's place here CPAP and invasive mechanical ventilation, which is usually performed after an emergency intubation. Now, what if the respiratory acidosis and COPD, let's say the patient has hypersecretions or increased amount of airway secretions? Do you need to place the patient on mechanical ventilator support? No, what you will do to institute airway clearance therapy. Or, so this is a group of therapeutic procedures that aid the expulsion of the secretions from the patient's airways. So here we have the assumption that the patient is too weak or unable to expel these secretions. Airway clearance therapy might include um, Procedures like postural drainage therapy, chest physiotherapy, or the use of breathing techniques or breathing exercises that could help the patient expectorate the secretions better. What if the patient has an artificial airway inserted and yet he has developed or he has produced a lot of secretions? Then the management here would be bronchial hygiene, which includes suctioning, hyperinflation, and the use of mucoactive drugs such as your acetylcysteine to, to decrease the viscosity of the secretions for easier removal through suctioning. The third management for respiratory acidosis in COPD patient is it doesn't actually correct the acidosis by itself but this is a supportive management since all COPD patients in acute exacerbation has a high tendency to develop hypoxemia. Well, I am speaking of oxygen therapy or oxygen support. So how much flow or how much liters per minute of oxygen would you administer to a COPD patient? There's no definite answer because it varies depending on the patient's PO2 or on the patient's hemodynamic status. But what's certain is there are only two devices that is acceptable when you are administering oxygen therapy to a COPD patient and these are your nasal cannula and your Venturi mask or your air entrainment mask. You might argue with me that COPD patients need high flow oxygen. Okay, that is true. That is true, but, but in reality, especially on the early onset of exacerbation in a COPD patient, even the nasal cannula would suffice to support the oxygen needs of the patient because again, the oxygenation, the patient's oxygenation is not really of the highest priority. The highest priority is always restoring the pH to its normal levels and the PCO2 to its pre-exacerbation levels. The oxygenation problems associated with COPD would be restored once the CO2, once the ventilation problem has been restored. I'm not saying we don't treat the hypoxemia, but what I'm saying is Correction of the hypoxemia should be less aggressive compared to correction of the ventilation problem. I hope you understand my point. I hope you get my point. So the other etiology for respiratory acidosis that we mentioned a while ago is when there is an overdosage or overadministration of certain drugs such as your alcohol, your narcotics, or benzodiazepine. <clears throat> so the initial management for drug overdose is the administration of wait is the administration of an antidote. And the most familiar or the most common antidote that you will encounter in your clinical internship is your naloxone. So for respiratory therapists, naloxone is one of the five drugs that can be administered via the artificial airway or your endotracheal tube. Although naloxone could also be administered through intravenous axis or intravenous route. What about if the acidosis is caused by obesity hypoventilation syndrome or central ventilation, uh, central 
hypoventilation syndrome. So for patients with obstructive sleep apnea, primarily we advise patients, we advise patients to, well, reduce weight. This is the simplest and I think the most effective intervention for obstructive sleep apnea. Although um, we could also offer nasal CPAP. The use of nasal CPAP or nasal BiPAP depending on, depending on the severity of the patient's condition. Nasal CPAP has also been proven to be effective in managing ventilation and oxygenation problems among patients with OHS. For and finally, what if the acidosis was, was a result of inappropriate ventilator settings or ventilator, mechanical ventilator settings, especially something that, that reduced the minute ventilation. So the management here is obviously to do the opposite, increase the minute ventilation. So again, nit ventilation is merely a product of your RR and your tidal volume. So the management here is to increase the tidal volume and increase the respiratory rate. So a common question that I've encountered among students and among beginner RTs is which of the two do you adjust first? Do you increase the tidal volume first or the respiratory rate? As a general rule of thumb, you adjust the tidal volume first. So make sure that the tidal volume is appropriate for the patient's condition. For non-ARDS patients, a tidal volume of 8 to 10 ml per kilogram of ideal body weight is acceptable. So first ensure that the tidal volume that you're giving to your patients is within this range. Or if you have an ARDS patient, you will have 4 to 6 ml per kilogram of ideal body weight. So if you have set this as your tidal volume and still you get a persistent respiratory acidosis, then that's the time that you adjust the RR. Your goal here is to wash out the excessive carbon dioxide in the patient's lungs. The larger the volume that you deliver, the more gas or the more carbon dioxide that can be washed out. And the higher the RR, then the faster is the washout. Another strategy to avoid or to reverse respiratory acidosis. So this is especially true for COPD patients. Another way to resolve or to correct respiratory acidosis is to make sure that the IA ratio is appropriate, which is one is to three or one is to five. Why is it important to have a long expiratory time or TE? COPD patients develop air trapping when compared to a non-COPD patient, a COPD patient needs more time to expel the CO2. But how do you adjust the IA ratio to be like this, 1 is to 3 or 1 is to 5? Now, you have to manipulate your mechanical ventilator by adjusting your inspiratory time or your flow rate. So the shorter the inspiratory time, the longer is the expiratory time. The higher the flow rate, then the shorter the inspiratory time, and therefore, the longer the expiratory time. So you need a short inspiratory time and a high flow rate. You will notice that when you shorten the inspiratory time, you will actually increase the flow rate. And the opposite is also true. When you increase the flow rate, the inspiratory time also shortens. What about if the patient is not intubated and is actually on CPAP? So what do you need to change in order to correct the respiratory acidosis? So for non-invasive mechanical ventilation, what you need to increase is your pressure support. The pressure support is the difference between your inspiratory pressure and your expiratory pressure. So the higher the pressure support, then the more CO2 that can be driven out of the lungs. So how do you increase the pressure support? Well, you adjust the IPAP, you increase the IPAP, then the difference between the two will be larger. Now, one concern that I've encountered in one of my affiliation center when I was an intern is, is that they change the length of the breathing circuit. So when you have a respiratory acidosis, they suggest is you cut the breathing circuit, make it shorter. I don't really recommend this 
The only time that you need to cut the breathing circuit is when it's too long, when it is longer than the manufacturer's recommendation. The relationship of the breathing circuit and PCO2 is not really well established. You cannot really predict the amount of CO2 change associated with the size or the length of the breathing circuit. So this would require multiple arterial punctures just to, to monitor the changes in PCO2, which is not really good since you'll be pricking your patient's arm very often. I don't think your patient will like it. So now we are on our last topic for this lesson. So what are the things that cause respiratory alkalosis? So you might probably think that this is the opposite of respiratory acidosis. If the cause of respiratory acidosis is something to do with hypoventilation, then for respiratory alkalosis, the cause is hyperventilation. Well, this is actually true. If you're if you going to make a list of the things that causes respiratory alkalosis, this is definitely shorter than the etiologies of respiratory acidosis. And the most common etiology for respiratory alkalosis is hypoxemia. Any event that decreases the partial pressure of oxygen in a patient would result to a respiratory alkalosis. Another common etiology is the presence of pulmonary embolism well, in the absence of hypoxemia. A patient with pulmonary embolism is usually tachypneic but the mechanism by which pulmonary embolism without hypoxemia causes respiratory alkalosis is not yet fully understood. Now, less common causes for respiratory alkalosis would be the presence of pain or anxiety. For example, you have a patient in the ER and he's panicking about a certain stimuli or a certain event, then the body's response is to well, hyperventilate. Another less common cause is if there's an overdose of drugs, especially um, theophylline and nicotine. And a while ago, we've also mentioned that, well, brainstem lesions could result to both acidosis and alkalosis. And for number six, respiratory alkalosis could also result from inappropriate mechanical ventilator settings, especially the settings that increase the minute ventilation. So a high televolume or a high RR would result to a patient having respiratory alkalosis. For the management, I think it is most practical to discuss hypoxemia and mechanical ventilator settings since Although pulmonary embolism is common, the management for pulmonary embolism is largely physician-based and is beyond the scope of respiratory therapy. So for the first etiology, which is hypoxemia, if hypoxemia is the cause for respiratory alkalosis, then we have several options. The most basic options is oxygen support or oxygen therapy, the administration of oxygen. If the, if the hypoxemia cannot be resolved, with oxygen therapy, then this could be addressed using non-invasive mechanical ventilation using CPAP. And finally, if the hypoxemia is so severe, a more aggressive resort is emergency intubation and eventually hooking to ventilator support. But the instances or the situations wherein hypoxemia warrants intubation and mechanical ventilator support is in the presence of a type 2 respiratory failure or hypoxemic respiratory failure. Now, what about if the cause of the alkalosis is inappropriate ventilator settings? Usually what happens is probably you have set a high tidal volume, a higher than normal or a higher than needed. So, clinic so clinically, what usually happens is in your mechanical ventilator, let's say you have put an adequate amount of tidal volume, you use the range of 8 to 10 ml per kilogram or 4 to 6 ml per kilogram if you have ARDS. And yet, your main problem is you have a very high total respiratory rate. But when you check on your settings, on your control panel, you've set an appropriate backup rate. The, the only problem is that the total or the measured respiratory rate is higher than the set 
respiratory rate. So in these scenarios, what you need to do is to check your other settings, especially your sensitivity. Maybe you have set the ventilator too sensitive. Another way, another thing to consider is perhaps it's time to switch modes. So an example, most especially shifting from AC, ACV to SIMV or a spontaneous mode of ventilation like pressure support ventilation. What are the criteria for switching modes? This would be a long discussion, so I think I will be posting a separate video on this. I will be starting mechanical ventilation series in the future, so please watch out for it. So that's pretty much the end of this lesson. So I hope you've learned something today and I hope I've helped you in your studies. Uh, this has been longer than what I expected. I was only planning to post four videos, 10 minutes each, but I didn't expect the discussion to be longer than usual. But I hope all these videos in this series help you understand ABG interpretation and, and how to use it in the clinical setting. In the clinical setting. So as promised in this channel's trailer, I will be posting other videos, other series in respiratory therapy. I hope you've enjoyed this series as much as I do and I hope you'll continue watching videos that I'll be posting in this channel. Thank you for watching. I'll see you on the next lesson.